Don't tip your cat. I'll kill you. It's hard being a star. <laughs> You're on the show. Good evening. Welcome to the Westchester Area Education Education Committee meeting. The first thing, the first thing the Education Committee needs to do is approve the minutes from the last meeting. So, if I can look around, yes. one, two, Dr. Yes. One on at a time. And we have four two zero, Dr. Missett. All right. Tonight we are going to approve two textbook recommendations. The first one is from Dr. Paul Joyce. So if you will come forward and speak to us, Dr. Joyce, about the new science textbook your committee worked on. Hi everybody. Hi. Michael, am I supposed to put this on or just yes, please? Let me know if I'm too close. It's nice to see everybody. I've sat in this room a lot with just one or two people like far away with masks for a while, so it's nice to have you all here. I just want to tell the board a little bit about the courses, um, just briefly, and then a little bit about the process, and then obviously make the request for the, um, the two books. So I think, I don't think a year has gone by that I haven't been here for approval of a textbook as we've been modifying our programs. Um, this year, the two courses that we're seeking um, approval for are our environmental science course and our physical science course. And if you recall, when I asked for the budget for this during the budget uh, meetings, these courses are not taken by all of our students. Um, we made a commitment years ago that every single ninth grade student would take biology. And so that's what we've been doing for a while. Sometimes when students get through biology, there's still a little bit of a question of additional need with support in the areas of reading and study skills and things like that. So we changed these older courses into courses that would accommodate those students who maybe couldn't quite reach chemistry in their sophomore year. And so our environmental science course we have listed as a 10th grade course. And that course, we front load it with a little bit of chemistry and some study skill support in the hopes that a student who is in 10th grade and goes into the course may even make the recommendation for chemistry for that year. If they don't, we have some chemistry near the end of that environmental uh, science course, so we kind of front load it and we back load it. The goal is that maybe they would be able to get into chemistry then in their junior year. If that doesn't work, we then have the physical science course where we basically do the same thing. The goal is that ultimately every student will have a chance to take a lab course. So even the most struggling students, if they go from biology to our career and college prep environmental science and our career and college prep physical science, there's still the goal that in their senior year they might be able to take a chemistry class and have one lab course before they graduate. So that's the purpose of these courses. Um, the process that we used was the same one that I've used for years, although we did it during the global pandemic, as you're aware. So we started over a year ago and we reviewed um, textbooks from five different publishers. We had books sent to my office and to all three schools. Um, the teachers spent time reviewing the, product, the uh, textbooks in three different ways, during their own time, during the school day, um, some blue card time after school, and during PD time. The one thing that was missing was the big sessions that I would have here in years past. The way we replace that is we specifically identified three teachers who had definitely taught both of these courses before and asked them to spend extra time evaluating all the books. That process narrowed our books down from about 15 total between the two courses to uh, four. And we brought those to the committee. Uh, the committee, we had uh, Megan Moore and Priyanka Gupta parents. Uh, Jackie Pavlo, assistant principal at Fugit now, joined us. I had Rob King, science teacher and department chair from East High School, Ryan Knight from East High School, Marie Snyder from Henderson, and David Smith from Ruston. So we had all the schools represented. All of those teachers had taught at least one of these courses before. Um, we, we had our committee meetings in March. Every member received the board policy um, 
108, AG1 and 108, um, AG2. Um, when we met, I always have the um, teachers try to work with the parents a little bit to start, to kind of talk through and, and look through the book and become familiar with the form. And then this uh, go around, we sent the books home with the parents. And the parents then brought back completed forms to me here um, over a period of time. Um, in our second meeting, we had some conversation about what people's perspective was on the different books. I always let the parents go first because I don't want them to be skewed by what the teachers or the administrators say. Uh, we went through that process and fortunately, it was very pleasant, we came up with a unanimous decision um, on both textbooks, um, which I have submitted to Dr. Scam in the approval forms for environmental science, your world, your turn for the environmental science and for the physical science and Glencoe version of the, of the textbook. Um, I do have the list prices on the forms, about $102, $111, and I would remind you that um, the budget was already approved for these books at, at previous budgetary meetings. And that's about it. Any questions? I just had a quick question. How will the uh, students know like which of those sciences would be most appropriate for them? Who's going to help direct them into those into those pathways? So when we so when we reworked these courses a few years back, all of the schools science departments had members involved, and we've communicated that out to the um, guidance counselors, the schedulers, the guidance counselors, particularly the science department chairs in the high schools are well aware of the purpose of these two courses. And it's not a huge number of our students, so there actually is a lot of um, time dedicated by multiple adults in making a decision whether a student would go into this course um, or not. So I'm just thinking about some of the students that may, that they may have the, uh, they may not have the awareness to even raise their hand to go in, those courses but they may do well or they may have interest but what if the teacher says I don't think they're going to do that good would you let them try it yeah so one of the things that we do at the high schools for any of our courses including our science courses is if the teacher has any feeling that there's um, a little leeway on what some students you know they're going to go into a certain level a certain course mm -hmm. and there might be a very brief conversation with students like this, where you're going to make a decision, okay, do they go into chemistry or do they go into the environmental science? That's a one-on-one -on -one conversation that that teacher has with that student. It also, also becomes a conversation that that student can have one-on-one -on -one with the guidance counselor. And obviously, if, um, if we can, we would involve families in that conversation too. I think I'm, I'm just thinking about some of the minority children and getting them it seems like this program, this, the way you described it, it seems like it would be um, the kind of course where maybe if the students were kind of urged to be in that, they, they could possibly do well, even if they don't think they're science ready or if they're not, or they have a fear of chemistry or a fear of the other sciences. They might, you know, with a little urging, be, um, it, it may be appropriate for them. That could close some of the, the gap that the, with the sciences and math and so on. I'm just interested in seeing our kids go through those types of courses. Yeah, I, I agree that this is, these courses are, they're basically systematically designed mm -hmm. to help close the gap. Um, and again, if we can get a student into one of these, then the goal is that we can get them back up into a lab science class upon completion of one of these courses. I, I would just like to see somebody champion the courses to get to urge this more students to go through. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the rest of the board, our audience? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Joyce. You'd like us to vote right now, wouldn't you? Uh, we'll start with you, Just Mr. Durnell. Yes. 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 Okay, that's four to zero, Dr. Mitchett. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely.
Thank you. And the folks that, that uh, Paul has just been describing are behind Randall and Karen. We have a uh, display back there. It includes the science text as well as the Latin text, which I would like to talk to you about next. So there you go. Uh, we had three Latin teachers. We do have three Latin teachers. All three were able to be on the committee. Uh, they're not here tonight, but they have been part of the work that uh, Sue had joined, as well as Alicia Ozer as our building administrator. And we had two parents, a middle school and a high school parent, join us. We received our materials in February. We were able to Zoom with the publishers to, to get a, a deeper understanding. Uh, and then the teachers did their own review, and that included checking some online communities for districts and teachers who were using the materials. So I was very impressed with uh, their due diligence as they reached out to other professionals who are using the textbooks to help inform our decision. Probably the most important group who had an opportunity to weigh in were our students, which was very exciting, a very interesting um, opportunity for them to kind of try out both of, both of the series that we were looking at. And the one that we're recommending is called Subarani, and it does not look like a textbook. It looks almost like a graphic novel. Uh, which was something that was very intriguing for the students, and they said that's a book that they would pick up. Uh, you can see that there, it's very character-based. It's uh, Roman society. Uh, our teachers and students both noticed the diversity, uh, the racial diversity as well, as well as socioeconomic diversity in the characters in the book. It um, was much more intriguing in terms of an approach to culture as well as to the Latin language. Now our teachers realized that that could be somewhat of a disadvantage in terms of needing to support with grammar and vocabulary exercises, which they felt prepared to do. They feel they have resources that they can do that and that was more important to really reach students and try to get students interested in the language to continue with them. So the recommendation is that we look at Subarani uh, one of the things that we noticed as we worked through, we worked with technology to check about Schoology integration and whether there was any complications there uh, in terms of how the, the teachers currently use um, Schoology for assignments. And we have we decided there there's not any um, concerns in terms of how we utilize that. Um, and I think perhaps most importantly is that this is uh, a textbook that they feel is um, not only very cost effective, um, in fact, <laughs> one of the things that we've, as we've been looking at our dollars and our curriculum proposal that we approved earlier this year, um, it, we're coming in well under budget with this particular text. So they were excited about that, uh, and I'll be back next month to talk with you about Spanish, because Spanish is underway, and that's coming in a little over budget, so we may want to take a look at the uh, allocation for world language. We may need a little of those Latin funds. We have much greater enrollment for Spanish, uh, so we may need to just adjust where we are with that. But um, this is a book that we're very excited about. Uh, we would look at for Latin one and two. Uh, next year, probably next spring, is when we would place the order for Latin two. Uh, there is a Latin three book. However, the teachers are undecided at this point, usually by Latin three. They have the students into more authentic texts, so they're not sure if they would go the textbook route or whether they would use more primary sources. So that is our proposal for Latin, and uh, again, we will need a vote on whether it is approved to move forward with an order. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments about Latin one and two? Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Subarani, is that, what does that mean? Is that the name of the place or? It's actually, um, it is a, a word that means hmm, not really suburb, not quite the suburb. I might have to rely on Dr. Sokolowski for our help, but <laughs> it's, um, it's a town. Uh, can you help me it's with it? Uh, the Savora uh, is a neighborhood in Rome that sat sort of upon a hill outside of the Roman Forum. Uh, so there was very much uh, in terms of like a marketplace. So I think when you open the book, uh, you'll see a lot of that that life that took place outside in Roman cities. So there's a lot of commerce going on and coming and going. And, and you'd be uh, surprised how much you probably could read, even picking it up. And just, yeah. You could, it's, it's that kind of a book, just in being able to interpret the language as you know it, because it is uh, one of the foundational languages for English, but even the pictures. And it's, it's foundational for Italian. Yes, and all Spanish of our Roman and, 
and uh, and so if you learn Latin, you're in good shape. And you know Dr. Sokolowski used to teach Latin, so <laughs> he loved this book. But any other questions or comments about anybody else? All right, we're ready to take a vote. Mr. Grinnell? Yes. Ms. Kessler? Yes. Dr. Shaw? Yes. And I'm a yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank both you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, what would an education committee meeting be if we did not get a chance to vote on, yes, the district calendar? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Tiernan. That's okay. This is uh, exciting as we welcome everyone back to this boardroom. I am going to review with you the, the, the final uh, district calendar for the school year. Um, as of today, we have nine weeks left of school, and those nine weeks are going to go very, very fast. We have one more in-service day in May, May 18th. We have one more day off on, um, uh, on the 31st of May, and the last week that we have in school is the week of June the 7th. This uh, June 9, 10, and 11 are all half days for students. The last student day will be Friday, June the 11th. The last teacher day would be Monday, June the 14th. We really expect to have a lot of people, teachers rather, flex out of that last day. They've been doing work with Dr. Florio all year long in order to earn those hours so they do not have to work on that Monday. Uh, but we do have some that come back. So I bring to you tonight the, uh, the, the final calendar that needs to be voted on. It will be approved in uh, the April 26th board meeting. Uh, just also the last graduation dates, or the, I'm sorry, the graduation dates are uh, June 8th for Henderson High School. Mrs. Tiernan, I'm not looking forward to that one. Uh, June 9th is East, and June 10th is Ruston. Wait, why not Henderson? Why not Henderson? <laughs> Um, I don't want my baby to graduate. My son is graduating. Yes, my son is graduating. We yes. hope. We don't know yet. <laughs> well, now we have like this, but Joyce and I also have grandsons. I know you do. Yep. I know you do. Yep. I know you do. I'll look for you that day. It's a big year. You'll see it. So I need your approval to move uh, this to the board meeting. Okay, to move the final calendar of the board meeting finally? Yes. This is our last chance to move the, your last chance. the graduation date to next year. <laughs> you want to? <laughs> I'm with you. Yes, yes. So, okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. And taking over again, it would hardly be a good meeting if we didn't talk about some new policies or revised policies and administrative guidelines, and we must vote on each of those separately. So, Dr. Sokolowski. One moment, I'm going to find a microphone that seems not to have well, so much feedback. <laughs> you just have, can't have more than one on at a time to get feedback. Everybody oh, that's cool. Okay. All right. Uh, I do have uh, two policies to bring to the board tonight. Uh, and we'll first start with uh, policy 247, hazing. Uh, and then the second policy will be policy 249, bullying and cyberbullying. Uh, these policies are being recommended for revision by our solicitor uh, for really uh, three reasons. Uh, one is it's being recommended that we remove the examples of the lengthy definition, uh, and our solicitor feels that uh, then when you provide that list of examples, uh, that you then are saying to perhaps your administrators, these are the only things uh, that could be examples of hazing. Uh, so that is why you see a lot of that stricken language there. Uh, the second part, if you uh, turn, is uh, as a result of Title IX uh, legislation, and we've been doing a lot of that since the summer, uh, we are updating the policy so that there is a reference uh, that if you do have an instance of hazing, uh, and when we move to the forms in just a minute, uh, you could have also an example of a Title IX violation, uh, which would probably be uh, we've moved from hazing to harassment, uh, if that is the case. Um, and that, as we look at the form, uh, the form wouldn't necessarily be uh, handled uh, right off the bat by the Title IX coordinator, uh, but if the compliance officer, so if it's a building principal handling a, situ handling a situation, uh, if they're finding evidence of a Title IX violation, 
then at that point, uh, it would go to the Title IX coordinator, uh, who is our HR director, Dr. Jeff Ulmer. Uh, so I just wanted to share, uh, that would be the, the highlight of the hazing policy, and then I can move, but I think we should take a vote on updating the hazing policy, and then we can talk uh, about the bullying, cyberbullying policy, Mr. Tiernan, so that we do have the individual votes. Question, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Does it make sense? Get your button. Does it make sense to have um, those definitions in and explain them as included but not uh, the complete list? I, uh, when I first heard you say that, I thought, yeah, because yeah, we don't want to give people ideas of what to do. For <laughs> but then I was thinking um, the definitions, as it's rewritten, is so broad mm -hmm. that um, it just says doesn't have any specificity to it. Yes, and I, I did talk to Amanda Sunquist, our solicitor, and her feeling was that uh, by putting all those examples in, uh, one of the things that she brought to mind is, um, particularly when we move to the bullying and cyberbullying, uh, that there may be examples of things that we haven't yet seen yet, uh, largely as a result of technology. Uh, so she felt uh, that that would be sort of less confining for us and be able to adapt to any types of changes. Uh, I would say as a school district, it's very rare uh, that we do see examples of hazing. Uh, do we see more examples of bullying and cyberbullying? We definitely do. Uh, but hazing does not, uh, it rarely ever appears uh, as a violation uh, in any of our, especially our six secondary schools. Um, now I'd assume as you're going over these things with your administrators, yes. that you're reviewing revised policies and changes and saying, okay, you'll notice not all these things are listed, however, before the year starts, right? Yeah, so what, what happens uh, really starting at this time of the year, uh, we'll see the most revisions to disciplinary policies. Uh, and then what we will have uh, the early part of June, uh, we will have a draft of policy 218, which is essentially our discipline manual. Uh, and I will review with the principals <coughs> Uh, those changes that we've seen as this would be just a first read tonight uh, this policy uh, would not go into effect until really the very end of the school year uh, so you're right uh, Mrs. Tiernan that we would review uh, these materials um, uh, as we would approach the end of the year and certainly over the summer uh, so that we're prepared okay thank you you're welcome any other questions or comments about this policy this revised policy uh, I had one question, and it kind of applies to both policies, and that's how the safe to say system might incorporate into that. I don't know that it's mentioned in either policy. Uh, no, but that would be one way that we could obtain a report. Uh, and what we'll see when we start to move to the administrative guidelines, uh, there will be a standardized way to collect this information. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, my experience with safe to say. Uh, when you're gaining that information off of that portal, uh, it can come in very different ways. Uh, that we have the, the person who is monitoring, who may be talking to the individual, um, and it's not until uh, typically the, these reports come in late at night, sometimes early in the morning, uh, but the following day that we're able to have a counselor or administrator meet with the students. Uh, and as we'll see in a minute with the administrative guidelines for these policies, there will be a very standardized way, I think it captures our practice, but there will be a standardized method to gain this information. So, so I mean, that's kind of, it's, it's, it's there, but it's not mentioned. Correct. Okay. I think, I think below most of the things that are in that paragraph above are spelled out in the num numbers one, two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. Bullying, cyber bully, bullying policy for the very same reasons uh, it is being brought forth uh, for a revision. Uh, you can see there also the, the striking of the language of, that's providing the examples. Uh, and we've talked about that for the previous policy. Uh, and then when you turn to the, uh, uh, the second page, uh, you can see how the policy then uh, ties to Title IX uh, 
sexual harassment and other discrimination. So there, if there is the potential for a report uh, to perhaps appear to be more than just bullying or cyberbullying, if it is in fact uh, something that would cross that line with harassment, uh, then our Title IX coordinator would review that. Um, and as we'll look in just a minute, we'll, we'll review the forms uh, to gain that information. But those are, as I said, they're very much side-by-side -side policies in terms of the changes that we're looking at uh, this evening. Questions about this one? So wait, so we, we included, we, are we now defining all harassment as sexual harassment? Uh, it's Title IX sexual harassment and, and other discrimination. And that's staying in. So that would be staying in. And that is just consistent with uh, the Title IX changes that we've seen. Okay. Okay. Um, Sue? So, I, I think it's good to actually have some flexibility in the uh, guidelines by taking out, I guess, the definition file, is that the idea, so because cyber, all these things are moving so quickly? Right, and just in speaking to uh, Amanda Sunquest, it was just very much that, that, and especially when we're in that realm of cyberbullying, uh, where we have seen over the years changes as a result of technology. Uh, so the policy would be able to adapt to, because a parent might say to you, well, wait a minute, that's not in one of the examples, so therefore it can't be bullying or cyberbullying. Uh, and as an administration, we know, especially in that realm, we have to continue to stay on top of those trends and sometimes those unfortunate trends that we see uh, with the use of technology, particularly social media. The administration makes the call, you know, or, you know the, the, the definition is... Yes, the and, and most often, too, that that would be not, it would be in consultation with the building team, uh, that they would be speaking with me uh, to ensure that we have consistency you know, across our schools upon making these decisions. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Awesome. All righty. Uh, I think I do have a question. Would this, would this also cover the student, like a student who purposefully mis misgenders another student? Yes, and if you go back to some of the Title IX work that we did at the beginning of the school year, uh, that was something that was specific and that that could be something that would be con could be construed as actually harassment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so back to you, ready to vote for the first reading. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, four yeses, Dr. Missit. Thank you. And now, and now we have, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, there would be individual forms. They're very similar to one another, but there would be uh, an administrative guideline for uh, policy 247, hazing, uh, retaliation report form. Uh, and as you look through that, uh, you can see that it provides uh, the opportunity for the statements to be made, uh, the information to be gathered, uh, and so that in each incident, uh, where we may have a claim of hazing, uh, that we would be collecting that information in the very same way. Uh, so this form would go to the building administration, uh, and then if it is perceived as something, as you look towards the end of the form, um, if you believe the allegation involved discrimination or Title IX sexual harassment, uh, then it references uh, that it could go to the, could go to the Title IX coordinator. Um, and if that is the case, uh, the Title IX coordinator would look at it uh, with that type of a lens uh, and work with the building administration to determine uh, if in fact it is a Title IX violation. Uh, and then you could see the, the charge, you, sometimes you could see it as it's bullying as well as harassment, uh, which in our discipline code uh, is a level three infraction, which is the most uh, severe that a student could incur. So that is the administrative guideline for policy 247. All right, questions about that? Judy? Uh, yeah, I noticed somewhat of a technical glitch and it's at the same point in both of the AGs. Okay. 
right above the uh, signature line, there's a fairly large blue box that says, uh, if you are the victim of the reported conduct, when you go to type in there, it looks like you can type five or six lines of text. You don't only allow one line of text. Right. It just goes off into the sunset where it doesn't wrap to the next line like it does in other parts of the form. So it's, well, it's thank you, Mr. Sabato. It looks can... wonderful, <laughs> but it doesn't work the way you would think it would we, work. And I think that who's ever filling out the form right. is gonna have frustration with both of them. Well, I appreciate that feedback. And what we will do between now and the next read is we'll make sure that we correct that so that the, the folks who may be filling that form out would not have that kind of frustration. Thank well, you. Well, I appreciate being able to say this in person rather than trying to type it on Google form. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? All right, Mr. Grinnell? Yes. Ms. Tesfer? Yes. yes. Okay, we're all yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so the last policy administrative guideline uh, is very similar, but it would be the report form uh, for bullying, cyberbullying, uh, 249 AG1. Uh, and as you look through that form, you can see that the information, the structure of it uh, is very much the same. And Mrs. DeFonso, I will certainly check to make sure that there's not any issue with the fillable portion of that. But, but like I said, same spot, both Same of spot, okay, thank you. <laughs> so any questions from the board, Mrs. Terry? Anybody else? Ready? Yes. concludes our meeting. Move for flattened textbooks to uh, policies. <laughs> bullying and cyberbullying. Right straight <laughs> line. Next meeting, May 10th. Look forward to seeing you there. And I'm turning it over to Pupil Services. Pupil Services. Pupil Services. Yes. On the mic. Services meeting is ready to begin at 7.02. And so the first thing we will need is an approval of our minutes from the last meeting. Yes. 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 Four yeses. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, I sent to you all the PowerPoint on disproportionality. And so that will be presented by Dr. Ramirez. And I did do some uh, a little bit of updating. I got up some more information, and so I've added that. I did send it out to you a little bit earlier this afternoon, Mr. Chester, but you probably didn't get a chance to see it. Dr. Stanley, I think you I did see it. You updated right. one? Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to explain uh, disproportionality. And this is, if we go to the second slide, Dr. Stanley, please. Okay, we are, the federal government a few years ago, um, required that we look at students to make sure that have disabilities, but to make sure that we're not disproportionately identifying them, placing students or disciplining students higher than the rate of the general population. And we look at those specific areas, identification and placement, and then discipline. Every year, based on our December 1st special education child count, data is reviewed, as well as our October 1st enrollment. And there is comparison. If we're disproportionate, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, for three years in a row in a specific area, then we have to have a plan. And I'll, I'll again, I will go into more detail about that. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. So if we're flagged for being disproportionate, um, and this actually started the first year we were disproportionate was in 2016, 17, 18, looking at those three years, we have to review our practices and our policies to make sure that they are in compliance. And in addition to that, we have to spend 15% of our IDEA dollars on early intervening services. And early intervening means prior to students being identified. So not taking, so we're taking those 15% and spending them on the general population 
to, to mitigate the areas of disproportionality. And so we went through that about two years ago, I did a presentation when we initially had been identified as being disproportionately um, identifying our black students as emotionally disturbed. So every year we are looked at um, for, over a course of three years, and this is the third year that this has been reviewed. So the next page. So it just again, kind of reiterating, um, we're looking at this year at data from 2017, 18, and 19, and the the criteria is that it's three times greater than the rate of that student race um, that is that is occurring for that particular race, and so it's in the area of the race and the 13 disability categories, so there's 39 ways that we can be disproportionate in the areas of identification, discipline, and placement. Okay. This year, uh, we were found to be disproportionate in our students uh, that are black and emotionally disturbed, as well as our placement of stu Asian students in the regular education less than 40% of the day. Um, uh, so those are the two areas. So over the course of the three years, we were considered to be disproportionate. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you specific numbers of students to put it in perspective uh, by analyzing that data. Okay. This is actually the, the, uh, a, uh, a clip of the website in the areas that we were considered to be disproportionate. And you can see uh, at the top it, for the identification, it was emotional disturbance. Uh, underneath of that was the Asian in the LRE, which is placement. And at the bottom of that, you'll notice that it has two yellow marks. And those yellow are, are areas that we were in mourning for because there was two years that we were disproportionate. One of those is for um, out-of-school suspensions for less than 10 days. And the other is disciplinary total removals. And I'm going to read you the definition of total removals. It includes in-school and out-of-school suspensions, expulsions, removals by school personnel to an interim alternative education setting, and removals by hearing officers. So basically, every time a child is removed from school for whatever reason, it's falling under that category. And both of those we were cited for black students being disproportionate in, in um, 2018 and 2019 based on those child counts of December 1st. Go to the next slide. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of, of I took so what I did to say to analyze the data. We we do get some um, large uh, broader t um, numbers from the website, but I went into the actual reports for our December first and analyzed that data to see what it shows me because I can't get it just from the numbers. And as you can see, so looking at December 1st, how many students for, that were Asian that were in the LRE in regular education less than 40% of the time? Um, it, it's ranging anywhere from 14 to 17 students. It's not a lot of students, but it has a big impact because there's not, it's compared to the, to the amount of students that are Asian that are in special education for LRE. Uh, and, and overall, it was three times more likely to, to to be in this category, okay? If I wanted to look at how, how students were identified, did we identify the students? Did, where were they identified? Of that there was a total of 27 students over the course of four years, because some of those students are in every single year. Some of them are newly identified or each year. So I wanted to look at that. So of the total 27 students, 20 of them were identified in early intervention prior to coming to us. Six of them were students that moved into our district already identified, and the last is we identified one of those students. And when you look on the right, I wanted to see again, what type of program are they currently in? And the majority of them are in our verbal behavior autistic support program, which, you know, we've talked about that program in other meetings. It's a very, it's a, very good program that we implement with Fidelity that came out from the state a number of years ago. Our students are making great progress. We have families that move into our district for that particular program. They don't spend a lot of time in, special, in regular education. 
but is appropriate for them. So we're doing right by those, those students in that program. But yet we're disproportionate because they're not in regular ed for a greater period of time. And then I broke out some of the other programs they were in because this is not by um, disability this time, it's by placement. So you can see the different placements in, the, in our district. And several of those students are placed by us in out of district placements, such as Vanguard, Camp Hill, the Wood School, um, but it's a total of 27 students. And next I broke down uh, the students that are black, um, that are emotionally disturbed, and this was a category that we, two years ago, we were identified as being disproportionate as well. Again, the numbers range from 16 to 18 students total. A total number of 32 students over the course of the four years. Um, 13 of those students moved in from other districts. Two of them transferred from Collegium, and 17 we identified, and I broke down the buildings because I wanted to see, is there a pattern in our buildings? Are we identifying more heavily in some buildings than others? And the maximum number of students that were identified with emotionally disturbed, emotional disturbance as the primary disability category was at Fugit and at Henderson at four, which still is not a significant number of students. And and then, before you move on, yeah. just to, to, about these numbers. So we had between 16 and 18 students each year. That's that's the number out of the total 12,000 kids in the district, correct? Correct. And it's based on the, the for this this slide is based on the number of black students that are in special education who are identified. 13 moved in, 15 actually moved in. When you look at the two collegiate kids, had those kids not moved in, would, would we have? No, we would not be disproportionate. Okay, no. so the program, which is an excellent program, is recognized nationally, is drawing parents to our school system. Correct. Correct, okay. And Correct. the same with, when you go back to the, the Asian slide, the Asian kids, same thing. We have a 20 early intervention, which means they came with an identified IEP Correct. in kindergarten. So they're coming out of preschool already identified. Yes. Correct? Yes. Six moved in. And had those six not moved in, would we have been identified no, in this group? We, we would not. not. Okay. 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 So yeah. our, 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 here's a case where the quality of our program, the way that this is, re, the, the, the data is reported, it, it hurts us in terms of reporting analysis of that. I mean, we, 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 do, we do well by the kids. Our teachers spend an awful lot of time and do a great job with the kids. Parents move here for these programs. These are very, very difficult kids to educate, and we do a great job. And as a result, you come in with an IEP and an autistic behavioral support program, it's going to be a ding against us in terms of the for disproportionality, for disproportionality in terms of this report. And okay. I have met with um, the Department of Education, and I, I actually met them again this morning, some representatives that actually work in this area where they're sending us the reports to make, to make sure I'm better understanding where the data is coming from. And, and, and they're basically saying, you know, they were, the federal, at the federal level, the law was made, and, and rightfully so. We don't want to be disproportionate. We don't want to be misidentifying students or over-identifying students based on their race. Absolutely not. Or, or by race, having them not be in regular education. That, that certainly from an equity lens would not be appropriate. So I so totally agree with it happening, but then the state said, then we have to implement it. The feds come out with it, we need to implement it at the state level. They're not putting a lot of emphasis on it, but they're following through what was being required of them. But they were very helpful in helping me to understand the calculation, um, which is one of the things that I added today. And I will, I will try to explain, because well, I had a very simplified way, I thought I understood that they was being how we were calculating this, and it, it's not as simple as it seems. So if I could walk through um, this to, to better explain it, and I'll look at the, the child count from 2019 and then 2020, and I'll start with our Asian students with that were for least restrictive environment. So in 2019, there are 13 students, and their numbers are slightly different than mine, be, it, and I think it's based on we might have had some changes from when that December 1st count came in compared to the, the, the kids that we have that may have been identified or moved in after that particular date. So if you were going to 
compare the numbers I listed on the previous page, it may be off by one or two numbers, and that's why, because I looked at specifically those, num those students, and I looked everyone up in our, in, our, in our IEP writer system. Okay, so in column B, there were 13 students in 2019 identified as being um, in regular education less than 40% of the time. 68 other students were also in that category that were not Asian, which gives a total of 81 for our district, and that's column D. The total number of Asian students with an IEP is 104. The total number of other students that have an IEP are 1,976. For a total of special education, 2,080 students as of December 1st, 2019. How it's calculated that we're three times greater than is these next columns. So column P B is divided by column E to get that column H, which is that 0.125. Then column C is divided by column F, and that gets the calculation. Then then H versus, I apologize, that should be H, not I. H divided by I gives you J, okay? That J column, that 3.63, is what we were disproportionate, three times more likely to happen. Three times higher, so we're 3.63. So it's over the three threshold, and that's why we're disproportionate. When we look at the, and I won't go all the way across, but if you look down one for 12-1-2020, so I was able to take the data, this is preliminary data because it's not been finalized. The preliminary data shows that we're 3.7, which means we'll be disproportionate again in this category for 2020. So we'll get another letter next year for this particular area. When you go down to the next area for blacks identified, this is done by total population, not by special education. So for example, on the first line, there were 17 students that were identified as emotionally disturbed and black. All other emotionally disturbed students, there was 115. For a total of students identified in the district, 132. At that time, there was 523 black students in our district with 11,547 other for a total of 12,070 students. And again, doing that division, if you look across, it becomes 3.263, so we were disproportionate in 2019. Based on the preliminary 2020 data, we're at 2.84, which means in this category, we will not be disproportionate next year for black emotionally disturbed. Did something change? Basically, I believe it is the, the number of students, um, the threshold stayed at 17, but there was a larger pool of students of, that were emotionally disturbed and slightly more black students. So it was, even though the number stayed the same, we are not disproportionate in that area. Before I move on, go ahead. So I just have a question about this. I'm, I'm not questioning your numbers, but I'm trying to understand your reasoning. So what I'm hearing is that the reason that we're disproportionate is because students that are categorized in these two categories are moving into our district, right? In other words, I'm hearing like we didn't do that someone else categorized them that way, and then they moved in. Is that right? For, for both of them, yeah. For many of them. So is there nothing that we can do once they're here? So I don't know, I don't quite understand the what's going on with the Asian students in terms of that category, but with the black students, it's what, emotionally disturbed? Correct. Right. So could they have been categorized in error? Like, once a student is categorized, does that stick with them for the rest of their life? Or as a district, can we look to see if they were miscategorized. Right, like so we, we reevaluate every three years. That's a okay. really good question. And we go through that process. And sometimes what will happen is 
of let's when we do reevaluate, so they might have the initial identification as emotionally disturbed. We might find that they might have either they're not emotionally disturbed, or there might be another health impairment or a specific learning disability that's the primary disability, and we would then either re-identify them in another in another way, or or change the identification, and that does happen, which is why. When I shared with you those numbers of total, as kids um, are reevaluated, that might move them off that particular list. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it absolutely, not as much what we're analyzing for the L. So some of the things that we're looking at, and we analyze like for the LRE piece of it, really analyzing those kids and saying, are we accurately reporting all of the time that they are in regular education? You know, when they're at lunch, when they're in the hallways, when they're in for homeroom for 10 minutes, are we calculating every minute to make sure that we're reaping that benefit of the time that they are in regular education? Because four of the students, when we looked at them for the 2019 data, were at 38 or 39% of the time in regular ed. And so is there a way, not, not falsifying, but are we accurately reporting those numbers? And that, so those are some things that we're looking at. We also need to be able to make sure that we're looking at what are our practices so that we're not misidentifying. We're making sure, you know, from a perspective of the Asian culture, some of the characteristics we don't want to misidentify as autism if it's not something, if it's based on culture. So we wanna make sure that our psychologists are looking at this from that equity lens as well. Dr. Scanlon, were you gonna say something? Yeah, there, and there's a couple of pieces too when you look at this. We had 28 additional black kids from 19 to 20. And I guess we could drill down a little bit. Are there are some kids that um, we have moved out of programs or as Leanne is saying, we have less time in those programs and more time in the regular classroom, so we make adjustments to that IEP. When kids move into our district with an, I, an IEP, that, we have to honor that IEP for at least a year. So it takes us at least a year to do that before we do reevaluate, um, you know, rewrite that IEP at the end of the year. Uh, a lot of people like the services when they're identified from outside the district, and, and you see some of that too, where parents go to a private or a public or a charter school and get identified and then come back with that IEP. And then we have to work that year to, to try to make it least restrictive. So we might have had some kids move in that were identified, but as we're moving them out, you see the number is still 17. We might have had some of that as well that, that took place with those 28 kids uh, from 19 to 20. So it, yes, we can do that. Yes, we do do that. I think an important number to look at is the number that we identify when we have the student. It is extremely low because our philosophy has been least restrictive environment from the day the kids start our schools. If they're already coming in kindergarten, 20 kids come to kindergarten with already identified IEP in these, in these kinds of severe programs, it's much more difficult for us to try to uh, find that least restrictive uh, mark without a couple of years of working with a kid. And, and we also want to make sure that it's an appropriate program because with the verbal behavior, they need to be in there for a significant period of time. And if we didn't do that, then we'd be you know, not meeting the child's needs and be, could be sued for not having an appropriate IEP. So it's finding that balance. And, so, and I think, for me, it's finding why is this occurring? At least if I can understand that, if, and are there things that we can do to mitigate some of it? And with the black, uh, uh, black children, you're, you're using cultural competency as well in determining. Absolutely. And when you say absolutely, who would be the well, uh, are, are there people that are able to look through it in the appropriate lens is what I'm saying. Yes, and, and I, when the psycho well, one piece of it is the psychologists all, all go through our equity training. They've also had extensive work with um, Dr. Ortiz, who works with, we use what uh, the cultural matrix mm -hmm. in looking at students that either have English as a second language or when we're looking at race as being a, a piece of it that we're making sure that it, it's not based on culture or language and it's based on the disability and there's a, a bottle and our psychologists have had a, several trainings in that area. Additionally, when it's an initial identification, when an evaluation report is conducted, I read every one of those reports before they are issued. Now, I don't necessarily know the race, some obviously I would know being able to name what their, what their race is, but a lot of times I don't know. 
but I'm using the same criteria for every single report that I'm reading. So that's another layer that is there. But our psychologists do get a lot of training. Okay. Can, I think that, I, th I like the fact that there's, you know, levels of review, but I think if you're not, if you don't, if you're reading it and you don't know the culture or this, or those idiosyncrasies mm -hmm. of the, then that might, it, it's not a level playing field is what I'm saying. So when you're reading the report, something that might be out of order for a white kid may not be for a black kid. Right, absolutely. So how do you, how, how, how do you um, make that, you know, make that uh, assessment if you don't have all the information? I guess is what I'm asking. Right. And again, and those I, are critical pieces of information sure. that might have an impact on whether somebody's labeled or not, you know, and whether that label sticks with them or not. And if I have questions, so like for example, if there's a lot of discipline issues that are involved or a lot of behavioral issues that are in the report, I'm communicating with the psychologist. So if there's something that I need to know that they can share that information with me. So we take it very seriously. Um, most of the time when students are identified with emotional disturbance that we do, it's because of mental health reasons. It's very seldom that it's because of behavioral or um, yeah, behavioral kinds of th reasons that or discipline types of reasons that we're doing the we're having the identification. But if there's the, and, we, and maybe there's more that we need to do in that specific area. I did want to just briefly touch upon too, um, and, and again, we're going to go into more in depth analysis with our principals uh, on this, but looking at the discipline, in 2018, it was 25 students. In 2019, it was 16 students. And we were, so we're talking a small number of students, but it still adds up, because in that particular area, it's identification of our students that are, is compared to um, our all students versus just the special education students. So we will look deeper into that. And I've talked to Dr. Sokolowski and looking at our data from this year. We can't do that in depth of analysis until the end of the year because that's not necessarily just based on a December 1st count. Um, if you want, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Another, I know there's no issue then with the Latinx population? No, there is not. So there's no not just for, that, And there's, that's looked at. It's, it's, um, it, it, all the areas that we calculate race on is looked at and we are not just And we're going to delve at some point into di uh, discipline, correct? Right, and, and as I just said with Dr. Okay. Sokolowski, we'll be working with the principals, and this is really more at the secondary level. It's not an elementary issue. It's our students at the secondary level to see. Now, we, we predict that this year, that because there has been far less discipline um, across the district in general this year, that we will not be disproportionate for this coming year, but we will certainly be looking at that preliminary data um, at the end of the year once we get those reports. And probably over the summer, do a little bit more in-depth work with them on that area. I, um, yeah, I have a question. Um, I know the psychologists uh, do the assessments and they make you know, significant contributions to the uh, identification and placement. What's the makeup of our psychologists this, uh, racially? Do we have um, black and brown psychologists in our district? Yeah. And is it close to proportionate to what the student body is? Um, no, I don't think it's quite to the proportion. I'm, I, I, we, I, we, 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 I'm gonna think, how many? We have at least one, and who is um, biracial. And I believe that might be, I was thinking my counselors too. So right now I think we have one biracial school psychologist. In the second, in the secondary level. At the, uh, at the elementary level. At, who does reports that are in evaluations at our secondary level as well. Yeah, we have them travel. One out of 16, 6%. Pardon me? One out of 16 psychologists. Correct, I'm thinking you perhaps might. We've had others that are no longer here because they pursued administrative positions, but I believe right now we're at six. six. And any Asians 
psychologist? No. Um, the bi I'm sorry, the biracial, it, it, yes. Latin. Yeah. Latin and black or Latin and black? Latin and black. black. When, when students um, move in, when they're transferred in, uh, when you look at the IEPs, when you reevaluate, like a year later you said, um, are you finding a whole lot of discrepancy? Like are you coming up with the same type of issues or is our school district much better in identifying some of the things that are happening? I, I think when they're, when, do I, do I think, I think we do a great job with our evaluations. I mean, are there faults at times? Absolutely, but I do think we have a very thorough process. And it's not just the psychologist, it's an entire team, and the MTSS team, so it's including the school counselors, there's teachers, the parent, um, the student see it has a mental health specialist. So everyone is involved in the, in the development of that evaluation. So I think we have a, a really good process with that. We're not always assured that same process is in place in other districts when students move in. So it's always good to see how do they, um, how do students fit in in our and, and with our with our programs. You know, many of our buildings have a behavior plans, the PBIS, such as like in Mary C. Howe that other districts might have. So students may respond differently in once they have appropriate programs. So it isn't uncommon for students to not have behavioral or emotional issues after they've been with us. I mean, some still continue. I don't wanna say that we cure kids of having that, but it may have less impact and they may not need as much time in special education to meet their needs, which is what our goals are. So what, that, what does that mean as far as funds are concerned? And as you can see, that means we need to spend about two hundred forty to two hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars a year on early intervening services. Um, and that's fifteen percent of our IDA dollars. Okay. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what we kinds of things we've really broken it down in the last year or so, um, and, and how we're using our dollars. And it's in the areas mostly of social emotional learning and equity. And these are some of the things that we have been working on thus far. And one of the things that as, um, as Dawn is you know, developing her equity goals and work, getting diving deeper into her, to the equity work, are there other areas that we can support across the district um, in this effort that will hopefully help to um, mitigate some of the identification or put the supports in place for all students to meet their needs. But as you can see, like we did a, a number, not this year, but last year, a number of conferences in some of those social emotional learning areas. We, um, Dr. Tyrone Howard was here last year and we've continued some of that work through the Chester County Intermediate Unit this year. We're looking at you know, the impact of culture and the identification process. And then I mentioned like Dr. Ortiz with our psychologist. There may be some more work as we move ahead next year with our MTSS teams, which are our multi-tiered system of support teams in each of our buildings. What more can we training can we go through for that for the the impact of that culture piece? I think is big, um, and, and prevention strategies. One of the things that we're looking at for next year across the district, and this will be able to help support us. What are some prevention types of things since we've gone through the trauma of being in a pandemic? What are some things that we could put in proactively? We have lots of mental health supports through our mental health specialists and some of the other areas, but what can we do preventatively? And we're looking at using prevention specialists through some of our, our, um, our, our monies that we're receiving to put supports in place in each of our buildings preventatively, like tier one, tier two types of things. And I think these this work that we're talking about with equity will, will work very nicely in that as well. The last area, um, someone had uh, asked if I could include some information, and, and I think um, Mr. Dow, you had talked about the, you know, how many, uh, uh, you know, individuals of color do we have? And this is based from our human resource department. They uh, they put this together for me, looking at our administrative staff and our professional staff and the breakdown of um, by race. And it, if you look across that, in our administrative, uh, we have nine 
administrative staff members are 14.29 percent that are black, 45 um, in our professional staff, and our professional staff is going to include all, not just our teachers, but our psychologists, our school counselors, and so forth. 45 are black, or 4.52, uh, which is uh, about the rate um, of our black population right now, give or take. We don't have any Hispanic um, in our administrative team, but we do have 10 in our professional staff, which is about 1%. Um, we have one um, administrator who identifies as Asian and five in our professional staff. Um, no American Indian, um, no biracial individuals who identify as biracial in our administrative staff, and two in our professional staff. Any questions on that? I know that's a lot of information. Can you send that last slide to us? Yeah, I, and I, 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 did, I did this afternoon, this, too. Oh, maybe, the, maybe yep. I missed that slide. Yep. I didn't see it in my, okay. I mean, I think it would be helpful to have the, the overall proportion of the students of, in those racial groups next to those proportions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for providing sure. the statistics. Sure. Yeah, for the, a brief summary though, it's four and a half, about four and a half percent of our students are black. We have about eight percent Asian, about eight percent Latino, um, and about two percent um, multiracial. Those are our numbers. But we, we can add that to the slide. Yeah, absolutely. And yep. Thank you. And actually, it's probably easier if I send it to you as a spreadsheet um, mm -hmm. and add that information, it'll be easier for you to be able to see. Mm -hmm. I also have it broken down by building. I did not include that in this report, but if you'd like that broken down by building, I, I can certainly send that to you. I'd like to see that. Okay. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Are there any, uh, that, that ends the presentation. Are there any other, there's no approval on it, but are there any questions? Any questions from the committee, from the board? From the public at large. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ramirez. Oh, you're welcome. It's so wonderful to see everybody in person, I have to say. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, oh. That ends the pupil services meeting. Thank you. Smartly done. That was a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yes, yes. Yes.